Okay, so um, we're very fortunate to have today's closing keynote um, given by Josh Tenenbaum. So Josh is a professor of computational cognitive science at MIT. Um, he was named MacArthur Fellow in 2019. Uh, he's well known for studying issues related to human learning and intelligence. In particular, he and his group aim to answer the question, how do we humans get so much from so little? Um, so his keynote today is on reverse engineering human cognitive development. So take it away. Okay, great. Thanks everyone. Thanks Stephen and the rest of the crowd. It's a great honor to be here at the inaugural uh, joint conference in learning and reasoning. And I, I hope to be able to get together with you all in person at a future conference. Um, I'm also looking forward to the joint discussion with the other keynote speakers. Um, I think it's on Wednesday. So uh, hopefully we'll have time there for some broader discussion about some of the issues that I think we're all thinking about. Uh, I'm just going to share here. All right. So I'm going to be talking about reverse engineering human intelligence with a focus, as Stephen said, on cognitive development and trying to address the fundamental question that I think cognitive scientists, as well as AI researchers, going back to the beginning of the field, have been interested in, which is what do we start with and how do we learn the rest? Now, the starting point for the work that I do that's really, as Stephen said, kind of between cognitive science and AI, trying to reverse engineer human intelligence and use our insights to engineer more human-like forms of AI, like many people, I think, in, in this uh, community, is to look at the gap between what we have today in AI and what we would like to have. And I think, you know, many people would, would put this in different ways, but I think we would all agree that what we have in AI right now is some very useful technology, but nothing like real or true artificial intelligence in the sense of the founders of the field, what they had in mind. That is, we have really useful machine systems that can do things we used to think only humans can do, but we have nothing like a general purpose, flexible intelligence, any, nothing like a kind of common sense that each and every one of us as human beings can use to do every one of these things for ourselves without having to be built by a dedicated team of engineers with the world's uh, greatest tech companies investing huge resources as every one of these AI technologies um, has been uh, the product of. So what is the gap? What is the difference between the AI we have now and what we would like to have? And of course, I think there's many things, but um, I think, uh, again, like many people in uh, at this conference and in this community, I think we're realizing that what's been driving the recent successes in AI technology are advances in pattern recognition and function approximation, most recently as embodied in various kinds of deep neural networks, but really the long history of success in machine learning, which is clearly a success in recognizing patterns in big data sets and approximating arbitrary functions. And those are important parts, most likely, of human intelligence. But human intelligence also goes beyond that in so many ways. And what I've been focusing on in, in my work and with my colleagues are all the ways that our minds model the world and intelligence as modeling and inference. So that means not just recognizing patterns in data, but really explaining and understanding what we see or our ability to imagine things that we could see but haven't yet, maybe things that nobody's ever seen. But then we can make those things we imagine goals and plan actions to make those things real and solve the problems that come up along the way. Or from this standpoint, learning means building new models. That means learning from both our, uh, our successes as well as our failures. And learning can be learning from the data of our experience, but also learning from others by sharing our models so that we can grow knowledge socially and culturally through language and other means of communication. So this is the big picture that I think we should be aiming for if we want to build more human-like forms of AI. And I think as a field, we've been making some progress on this, although it's not as widely recognized as the successes in machine learning. Um, it's also fair to say that we have a long ways to go. I don't think we yet have uh, scalable, robust engineering solutions to human cognitive modeling of the world, even at the scale of a young child. But imagine if we could get there. Our North Star is this goal. Imagine if we could build a machine that grows into intelligence the way a person does, that starts like a baby and learns like a child. This may not be our only route to achieving uh, human-like 
general intelligence, but it could be our best bet because if we think about it, it's the only example we have in the known universe of a system that does reliably grow into human intelligence starting from much less, reliably, robustly. It's, it's our one example. And so if we could understand that and even make small steps towards that goal, this could be huge in terms of fundamental AI as well as advancing our technology. Now, of course, you know, this is an old idea. It's, it's, it's been one that's been advocated and explored and even embraced by many of the founders of the field, as well as many other AI research recently, maybe most notably and originally by Alan Turing in the same paper where he introduced the Turing test and the idea of intelligence as computation. He suggested that maybe the best way to build a machine that could have the intelligence that might pass the Turing test would be not to try to emulate an adult, but to try to emulate a child, to start off by building a child brain and then teach it like the way we teach a child. Why do this? Well, as Turing said, presumably the child's brain is simpler. It's an easier thing to do. Maybe the child's brain is something like a notebook as one buys it from the stationers, rather little mechanism and lots of blank sheets. Okay. Now, Turing was brilliant and also wise, and he knew to put the word presumably there. He knew he didn't really know what he was talking about. Nobody had really seriously studied children's brains and minds. Presumably, as many people thought, um, maybe we, as human learners, we start up as something like a blank slate, right? It's a classic idea in philosophy, as well as one that has been explored in earlier generations of psychology. But what we now know, based on insights of studying actual human babies and children is that it's not right, that both the starting state and the learning procedures for human learning are much more sophisticated than I think Turing was presuming here, right? That is, we don't start off as blank stars, blank slates. We start, we start off with a lot of cognitive structure, um, the idea of what's sometimes called core cognition, as Liz Felke has famously articulated, um, or as my colleague Rebecca Sachs has studied, not just in behavior, but in the, in, sorry, the, uh, is the motion sensor in my office, which is <laughs> inevitably, uh, if I don't move enough, <laughs> this is ridiculous. But, um, uh, I'm sorry, that might happen a couple of times during this talk and I'll just have to wave my arms so the motion sensor turns back on or maybe position myself in the right way. Um, I was saying as Rebecca Sachs, uh, my colleague here at MIT has studied, um, you can see even in the brains of three month old babies, the beginnings of the kinds of behavior that Spelke has studied in two and three month old babies, showing that quite a lot of basic common sense in some ways is built in. And learning isn't just copying down data, but much more active forms of hypothesis formation and testing, forming intuitive theories and exploring the world with something like kind of intuitive versions of scientific experiments to build our models beyond their initial starting state. So Alison Gopnik has famously articulated this child of scientist view. My colleague here at MIT, Laura Schultz, has especially explored these kinds of um, exploratory learning mechanisms that that are that children that make children's play look like a kind of informal scientific experimentation. And what we've been trying to do in our group is to capture these kinds of uh, knowledge representations and learning procedures in computational terms that could be used to both understand. Where, where human cognition comes from and to follow this kind of developmental scaling route to building more human-like AI. So in particular, we start with this idea of core cognition, the kinds of things that even a young baby can do that no AI system can do, such as intuitive physics and intuitive psychology. By intuitive physics, we mean the kind of thing that you see in this one and a half year old here, playing with blocks, stacking up cups, the ability to understand these objects as, as physical things in the three-dimensional world um, to conceive of goals like stacking up a, a number of them in a stable fashion, and then to make the plans and debug those plans, as you can see here, uh, in order to make uh, some awesome creation. Okay. We, don't, we have robots that got, can manipulate objects in impressive ways, but we don't have a robot that can do anything like this in terms of the robustness of perception, planning, goal creation, uh, not to mention just the physical hand manipulation that you can see here. But it's, I don't think it's out of the question that um, with the kind of research program that we're pursuing together with roboticists that we could build something like that. By intuitive psychology, I mean the kind of thing that you'll see in this other video here featuring a one and a half year old from the famous studies of Felix Wernicke and Michael Tomasello. So here, the, uh, the one and a half year old is a little kid in back who's a participant in these studies and um, if, you know, you might have seen this video before. Um, I'll play it twice just so you can you can really digest it. But what you're going to see here is um, this kid, 
um, seeing an action that he's never seen before. It's a little bit weird. Oh. Um, and what he has to do is figure out what this person's doing and why, and even how to help him. After the adult makes his motion, he stops. And more than half the time, what kids do is what you're seeing here. Namely, they go over and do something like opening the cabinet door, doing what we would intuitively say is the helpful thing to do. Now, watch this again and put yourself in the place of that kid and say, what has to be going on inside your head to be able to figure out this action? It starts with actually the intuitive physics, understanding solid objects, understanding maybe stable placements of objects as goals. But it really rests on being able to make a good guess at what that intention of that adult is. And then you can see something about the guess as watch when he steps back here and looks up and makes eye contact and then looks down at the hands. Right? It's as if, and I think more than just as if, he is signaling and showing right, that I think I've understood your intention. And if I have, then I think this is what you're going to do. And then indeed, that is what the adult does, puts the book down. So again, if, you know, we, if, we, had, if we could have robots that could be that, could be that kind of uh, helpfulness around the house, it would be amazing. And that means both the sort of orientation to be helpful, but really what is the common sense needed to understand flexibly people's goals in that uh, in, in a real world situation like this, when you know, you're not just following a script, but doing something that is a little bit unfamiliar, but that builds on the basic common sense understanding of the world and what people want to do in it. Okay. So um, what you can see here, these uh, diagrams with arrows, these are sketches of the uh, computational models we build, which are models of the mental models inside these kids' heads, models of how the state of the world changes over time and how it gives rise to images and models of how agents plan actions based on their beliefs and goals and then turn updating their beliefs based on their perceptual state. This The picture on the right might look like a picture of how the human mind works and maybe it is. Many cognitive scientists believe something like this is basically the right way to think about uh, human um, action. But just to be clear, this is meant to be a model of the intuitive theory of minds, right? And what we're trying to do is capture in computational terms, these intuitive models of the physical world and the psychological world that can be used as the basis for the kind of common sense AI that we're talking about. Okay, so how are we gonna do this? Well, there's a few technical foundations for the work that we do. Um, one is the idea, which again, I think is very much in the spirit of many of uh, the, the uh, contributions of this conference, is to think about how can we combine the best ideas from multiple eras of AI. That means not just machine learning, whether it's neural networks or other tools for pattern recognition and function approximation, but what is surely the, the uh, most original and best idea in how to think about intelligence computationally, which is the idea of intelligence as symbol manipulation and symbolic languages for abstract knowledge representation and reasoning. And then what I'd say is the third good idea that we've had, there, there's more than three, but these are at least three of the best ideas over the decades, is the idea of probabilistic inference or especially Bayesian inference in some kind of uh, causally structured hierarchical generative model for reasoning about the unobserved causes of what we what we see from the sparse uncertain data that come in through our senses. And I think that if we um, build the tools, the mathematics, the engineering platforms, and then models on top of those that let us combine the best features of symbols, probabilities, and neural networks, or, or any tools for generic function approximation and pattern recognition, that is going to be much better than what we used to do <laughs> in AI and cognitive science, which is fight about which of these is the right paradigm. But by recognizing their complementary strengths and then again building the tools that let us integrate them, that is going to be the foundation of actually making these models real. Now, there's different ways to do this, but with, with my colleagues at MIT and others in the field, I've been especially interested in probabilistic programs and probabilistic programming as an integrative uh, framework for combining these ideas. And you know, this, this isn't a talk in which I can go into the details on probabilistic programs and probabilistic programming, although it illustrates some of the things that we're doing with them. I'll just um, highlight that this, there's many different probabilistic programming languages that um, have been developed under that name for um, somewhere between 15 and 20 years at this point. Um, in particular, we're especially interested in languages like Pyro or TensorFlow Probability or Gen. Um, uh, Pyro was, was developed uh, at Uber AI Labs uh, by a team originally put together by Noah Goodman. Uh, 
TensorFlow probability is, is a uh, uh, probabilistic programming language developed inside Google um, by a team led by Riff. Uh, Gen is a language that was developed at MIT in Vikash Mansinga's probabilistic computing group, uh, but developed by Marco Cusimano Towner and colleagues, but especially Marco as, as the basis of his PhD thesis. All of these are languages that um, you might call modern PPLs because they build on top of modern frameworks for deep learning, like TensorFlow or PyTorch, but they build the, the abilities to have symbolically structured generative models and flexible probabilistic inference um, on top of those. If you're interested to learn more about probabilistic programs as a way to think about human common sense, I would uh, refer you to the probmods.org web book, which Noah Goodman and I and a number of others, uh, but especially Noah, um, have written and built out and it has a lot of introductory and interactive examples. Um, if you want to learn about the latest probabilistic programming that supports the kind of models that I'm talking about here, I'd especially point you to Gen and the gen.dev site, which has tutorials to get you started, uh, because I think this probabilistic programming language in particular is especially well suited to the kind of models I'm going to be talking about here. And I'll highlight a couple of places where we started using it to build the next generation of these models, although most of the work I'm talking about here was not built inside it. Um, so this is one key idea. And the second key idea has to do with, well, what are the kinds of programs that we're going to be doing probabilistic inference over and possibly accelerating with our neural network machinery? And here I'll, I'll um, introduce a slogan, which I like to call the, the game engine in your head. So the idea that um, the tools that have been developed in the game industry that allow game designers to make new games without having to write everything from scratch, without having to write all of computer graphics or physical simulation, um, or even what's called game AI, the ability to have non-player characters of the game interact with human players in somewhat natural behavioral ways. These tools might provide one possible um, working model of the kind of basic common sense architecture that's built into our human brains from the beginning, the kind of thing that Spelke studies in um, young babies' behavior and Rebecca Sachs has studied in young babies' minds, uh, brains, sorry, not minds and brains. Um, it's, it's, this, this idea is, sh I'm sure, wrong in many ways, but I hope it's interestingly right in some ways, that we don't just um, find, you know, uh, start with finding patterns of pixels, but we have basic representations about objects, kinds of objects, uh, places, um, agents, both our own self as an agent in a space and other agents that we can interact with, and startup software that lets us reason about and learn how the world works. So just to illustrate, if you, uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, for example, game physics, which approximates and hacks classical mechanics, um, as well as things like fluid mechanics with particle systems, in order to very quickly simulate uh, quite complex systems, whether it's multi-rigid body systems or soft bodies like cloth, um, very complex things like that uh, chain, a ball and chain swinging into a big stack of wooden cubes, um, snow, other kinds of uh, 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 liquids or fluids. Um, th these are examples of ways that game engineers have figured out um, to model physics not in ways that are trying to be ground truth accurate, but just look good over short time scales, um, look right. And that is also the design consideration of a lot of aspects of human cognition, right? If I wanna predict what's going to happen over the next couple of seconds in response to some actions I might take, this might be the kind of intuitive physics that we need. Okay. Um, I call this the game engine in the head to uh, make it to the contrast with another way that game engines and physics engines are often used today in more purely learning oriented AI, like deep reinforcement learning, where the game engine, um, it, let's say a physics engine is seen as the training grounds for an AI system, some kind of policy based system typically, that then gets deployed in the real world. And there's some, you know, you have to face some kind of sim to real challenge. Um, but here the idea is the game engine isn't the training grounds for our agent, rather the game engine is the model of what's inside the agent's head as its model of the world. So when this kid imagines what would happen if I roll this ball towards the stack of blocks with this uh, toy bird on top, maybe something like this would happen. And he constructs a simulation in his head of the outcomes of that action. And he sees, okay, well, this, this might knock the thing down and that's either what I want or what I don't want, probably what I want in this case. And that could be a way to uh, uh, test out 
and formulate and debug the plans that you might make, for instance, as well as understand what other people are doing and why. So over the last uh, 10 years or so, we've started using these kinds of ideas um, to capture human common sense in intuitive physics, intuitive psychology, and so on. So um, in intuitive physics, starting with work that Pete Battaglia and Jess Hamrick did, um, again, it really goes back almost 10 years, although the publications, uh, our first publication on the idea of intuitive physics engine based on approximate probabilistic simulation in a game style physics engine was published in 2013. Um, but we've been exploring, you know, again, many, many variations on this idea since. The basic idea is to um, uh, build models of how a person might appreciate a class of scenes like these blocks world scenes and make judgments such as how stable the blocks are by taking an image or a sequence of images, working backwards to infer the world state, and then and that's, a, that's a kind of probabilistic inference, and then making a posterior probabilistic in, uh, pr predictive probabilistic inference to imagine what might happen next. To illustrate how this kind of thing goes, the first step here is really a kind of um, model-based perception to view the image as the output of a function that you could describe as some kind of approximate graphics uh, representation um, that goes from some 3D world state like this wireframe block uh, CAD model that I'm showing there to the image that you observe. And then the idea is to Im approximately invert that function to make a guess at the inputs to that rendering function given the output. This here is one example of a, uh, a posterior sample from a very simple kind of probabilistic program based model. Um, Here's another sample. Um, I'm, I'm citing here, by the way, earlier work that was not about intuitive physics, but just this idea of vision as probabilistic inverse graphics that Akash Mansinga, Tejas Kulkarni, and colleagues, again, started developing a few years ago um, and published uh, together with me in a series of papers um, that uh, develop a, a range of different kinds of algorithms, um, which can include top-down model-based simulation. That's maybe the bet. When people think about using a probabilistic generative model to do sort of vision as inverse graphics, they might be thinking of some kind of Monte Carlo method, whether it's important sampling or MCMC, some kind of way of like generating um, you know, guesses in the uh, by, by say, taking random samples from say a, a, a CAD graphics model and then seeing how well they fit with the image. This can be uh, very powerful if somewhat slow. Um, the way it it was traditionally implemented. Um, other kinds of algorithms are more bottom up. So here's a place where you can use neural networks to learn to invert your probabilistic graphics model by training the model by drawing samples from the in the generative or forward direction, and that provides training data for the neural network. Or as we also showed, there are nice hybrids of these where you might use the, the bottom up neural network for data driven proposals or to initialize a top-down Monte Carlo inference. And that can be much, much faster than just pure top-down Monte Carlo inference, but much more robust than just purely using the neural network. And the latest and greatest version of this idea by Vakash and colleagues is just about to be presented in this year's NeurIPS conference, um, led by Nishad Gotaskar and Marco Cusimano-Towner and, and a, a, a Ben Zinberg and a great team, um, which again, I was fortunate to play a very small role in. Um, but this is a system called 3DP3, which takes as input um, real world data, both RGB and depth data. And it's really designed to try to take this idea into a practical applied robotic setting to infer um, a, a scene graph, uh, which includes both objects, their six degree of freedom pose, also in sort of reconstructing a, a cleaned up depth map and the sort of uh, stable, geometric, and ultimately physical relations between objects. And you have a generative model that's written in this language, GEN, this probabilistic programming language from uh, Marco and colleagues, which starts off by sort of sampling object types, their geometries, their scene graph relations, and all the way down to a synthetic depth map, which can then be compared with the observations in a combination of these learned bottom-up um, neural important sampling type proposals, as well as MCMC fine tuning. And Gen um, automates, um, makes both robust and scalable uh, these two different kinds of inference routes. And the result is is pretty impressive performance. Um, I'm, admittedly, I'm a little bit biased, but you know, again, my role in this project was mostly to inspire the idea and guide it in just very indirect ways. Um, but what what this team has done is to is to show that they can beat state of the art. Uh, deep learning based um, six degree of fr freedom uh, pose 
detection systems um, in both accuracy and robustness and crucially with systems that are uncertainty aware. So they, they know when, they, when the data they have might not be sufficient to localize where an object is. Um, so, you know, again, this, this, is, uh, this is all I'm gonna say about perception at this point, but I think it's, it's sort of the first building block of common sense is how do we get to a state of the world on which we can now start to do physical reasoning. And it nicely illustrates the ways that people are starting to combine uh, neural network, pure learning based approaches with symbolic models like scene graphs in a unified framework for probabilistic inference. Now, the next step, once you have your guess of where the objects are in the world, is to imagine what might happen next. And here, the simple idea is just to run that scene state estimate forward through a few steps of your physics engine and just see what happens. So here's one illustration of that with the first hypothesis I showed you. And here's another one. Um, these two different guesses at the state of the world lead to different outcomes in the future. The precise state of the blocks after a few time steps are different. But at the grain of intuitive physics, it doesn't really matter, right? Whether it's this scene or this scene, most of the blocks have fallen over. So what our system does is it, it takes a few of those samples and computes the average number of blocks that fell. And in this case, it would say this is a very unstable scene because most of the blocks are falling over. So that's the basis for how we build these models and test them against human judgments. Here, I'm just um, showing uh, an example of an experiment that we've done in our lab where we have on the y-axis um, human judgments for a range of these stimuli, these block world scenes, and the model predictions for the model I just showed you on the x-axis. And it does a pretty good job of capturing people's graded sense of how stable a configuration is. It does a much better job than if we just took the pure ground truth physics. And I think this is important because it shows the power of combining the symbolic approximations of the physics engine with the probabilistic inference that takes into account state uncertainty, as well as perhaps uncertainty, a little uncertainty about what forces are in play. The, the, the model I'm showing you here, which just replaces, some, it's basically exactly the same as the thing I showed you, but it has the correct ground truth state of the world and ground truth forces in the physics engine. Um, and it's, so in some sense, it's a more correct model, but it's a less good model of what humans do. The correlation is about 0.6 instead of 0.9. And I would argue that it's less robust because it doesn't appropriately take into account the uncertainty that we have that any kind of probabilistic vision system is going to, is going to give us. And what we, what we see in humans and what, what I think we want in our AI systems is appropriate propagation of that uncertainty through to our inferences. So we've, we've used this kind of approach to capture not just judgments about how stable things are, but, but a whole number of other different questions that you can formulate as queries in your probabilistic programming language. Basically any proposition that can be evaluated on the underlying scene state can be a judgment that the system can give you. Like which way will the blocks fall or how far will they fall? Or suppose I condition on some other information like the fact that the gray material is much heavier than the green stuff and I can see there those differences in the RGB space. And then I can, my system can, can appropriately set the physics parameters um, so that as you see in these two scenes here, the geometry of the towers is the same, but because they've been colored differently, my sense of which way will, they will fall is very different. And these models can capture that. Um, or if I see scenes that are surprisingly stable, they can work backwards to infer which material must be heavier. Um, just to illustrate one other place where the, where you have the power of probabilistic reasoning over just say a pure learning based approach, consider a judgment that unless you've seen me give this talk before, it's, you know, it's not something that you have any experience in. Unlike say, for example, judging whether a stack of blocks will fall over where you could imagine, and people have built systems that try to take a, a more learning pattern recognition approach. But if I take a judgment like this one, I ask what will happen if this uh, table is bumped hard enough to knock some of the blocks onto the floor? Is it more likely to be red blocks or yellow blocks? Okay. Um, here we might say red, um, here we'd probably say yellow, uh, red, yellow, yellow, um, probably you would say yellow, here most people would say red, um, yellow. These are more fun to do interactively, but um, I think you get some sense of what's going on. So how are we able to do that? Well, in our system, right, the very same model that I showed you can do this. We reconstruct a representation of the blocks and then we simulate um, a bump at the table. It might be a small bump like this. It might be a big bump like that. Um, notice that different things happen if you simulate a small bump or a big bump. And notice that I, I didn't run the simulation all the way to the end. I could, I can run this 
all the way to the end as the blocks fall off, but you only have to run a few time steps to get a sense of what's going on. And the simulation doesn't even have to be that accurate to know that all the yellow blocks and few or none of the red blocks are gonna go over. So again, at the grain of intuitive physics, a very rough approximations to physics and the probabilistic inference that goes along with that can be sufficient to answer questions that are not just familiar, but anything that I can formulate um, in the, the logical language of the system. And this model is able to uh, predict people's judgments on this red-yellow task almost as well as on the much more familiar stability task. Okay. In these models so far, nothing is learned except perhaps some of the vision system that gets you from the image to the to the 3D physical state. Now that's not to say that we don't do any learning in physics, I'll talk about that in a moment, but the key is just to see what can we do with pure probabilistic reasoning um, on top of the right structured model of objects in physics. Okay. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that you know another key part of human common sense, maybe the most important, is our social intelligence or our, the intuitive psychology that lets us understand how to be helpful or how when other people are being helpful. And I don't have time to really go into the details of this. I will just say that the same kinds of ideas of writing a generative model formulated as a probabilistic program um, can be used to model people's sense of what somebody's goal is, or even when in a joint interaction, when somebody is being helpful or not. And the key idea here, which our former student and colleague now at uh, Yale University, Julian Har Edinger has called the naive utility calculus is, the, is the intuitive version of what, again, we're all familiar from, I'd say, rational uh, expected utility decision-making and planning, that there's a trade-off between rewards and costs, and the rational thing to do is to maximize your expected utility, um, or the reward of getting to some goal state minus the cost of actions to get there. That simple versions of this idea um, can be the basis for models of how people, even young children, intuitively understand the actions that agents plan. And then we can we can embed those in a framework for probabilistic inference to work backwards, to infer what are the likely goals that somebody might have. To take a scene like this, where somebody's reaching on the tabletop for an object and figure out which object she's reaching for. You can see that that dash line that just went up there is the Bayesian posterior uh, over possible goal objects, where we've taken a robotics physics engine, the Mujoko model, as a model of what the cost of action, and then we're making a Bayesian inference over which object is providing the reward that would best explain the actions you see under the cost, the physical cost of action planning. Or we can make joint models of multiple agents planning processes where we want to understand what it means for an agent to be helpful, even in a strange situation like this, like where somebody's reaching with a constraint and we see somebody else clearly helping them to achieve their goal. What makes that look like helping versus say a scene like the one on the bottom here look uh, not like helping, but the opposite sort of hindering or getting in the way. Well, we can build a model that says agents are helpful if they are trying to maximize some expected utility function that appears to be a positive function of another agent's expected utility or vice versa or a negative function if it's if it's hindering and by doing inference in that joint agent model we we, we are at the beginnings at least of trying to understand what it is to understand each other in these cases um, so in the in the last part of the talk i want to talk about where learning comes into the picture at least learning more in terms of um, common sense. And again, I think we're going to see really interesting places here where symbolic approaches and the, the combination of symbolic, probabilistic, and neural approaches are letting us make steps, small steps, but I think important ones, towards the big picture vision that I started with. So, uh, you know, I, I think um, it's important to, to point out, I'm not, you know, the, 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 vision that I have here is not the only one that one could have. So there are a number of people who've been interested in intuitive physics, how babies represent and learn about objects, who who've taken more of that approach that I think Turing advocated, the more sort of blank slate end-to-end -end learning approach. That is one possibility that the, the systems that I've talked about effectively are the targets for learning. You start not having them, you start just having some kind of generic neural architecture and you learn them from experience. So for example, um, Dan Yeamans at Stanford in some earlier work with Nick Haber and colleagues has pursued some versions of this idea with a kind of curiosity-driven self-supervised learner that acquires some aspects of object-based perception and attention, also inspired by the idea of what babies know. But I think it's fair to say, and I think um, Dan and colleagues would agree with this, 
at this point, um, that this, this system probably is not the way babies actually do it, that it doesn't build in enough structure and it learns way too slowly. So the approach that, w that we're following is to think about what happens if you start off with some kind of a game engine or maybe a proto game engine. A game engine itself has many degrees of freedom and, and you could there could be a lot more or a lot less built in. But something like that kind of common sense system. And then learning comes in in all these different ways. Learning can come on top of the game engine. That's something that we might see more in adults. Learning can happen inside the game engine to learn aspects of the physics, or maybe even learning um, key fun foundational parts of the game engine itself. And then this whole, uh, framework can be used as the foundation to learn things that go beyond what the what the game engine or core cognition model is able to capture. So just as a, as a sort of quick survey of some of the recent work that we've been doing, looking at all these other ways that or all these ways that learning can come into the picture. Um, one thing is to take is to start off with the intuitive physics models that we were studying these probabilistic approximate simulation models and say well how can we learn to do to solve problems using these because again if we're thinking about human intelligence um, one of our core abilities is problem solving and and um, making or repurposing objects to solve the problems that stand in the way of achieving our goals so for instance let's say you've gone out camping and as you're setting up your tent, you realize that you forgot to take the hammer that you normally use to pound in your tent stakes. So you look around for some other object that you can use as part of a plan to achieve that same goal. You might find these objects out of the woods. Um, you might quickly rule out um, one or two of these as not suitable to your goals um, that, and focus in on the hard stones. Um, and But there you also may quickly realize that some of these have the right kind of affordances or physical properties. Um, this one, for example, uh, you might try pounding it in and you're not getting enough leverage. So you switch to uh, oops, uh, you switch to something like this longer flatter stone, which gives you more of the uh, hammering ability that you want. So to study this, um, we've uh, uh, been studying studying sort of flexible problem solving and tool use in something called the virtual tools game. Um, I realize this slide is actually a little bit out of date because this, this paper has already appeared in PNAS. Um, it's the thesis work of Kelsey, Kelsey Allen, who's now a uh, research scientist at DeepMind, um, along with uh, Kevin Smith, who's a research scientist in our lab, and they're joint first authors of this work. And um, what you can see here is um, just a, a small sample of different levels in this game, where the goal is always to get the red ball into the green region, and have it stay there stably for a couple of seconds. And you do this by choosing an object, a tool from the palette on the right and dropping it into the scene. Blue objects are things that can move along with the red object. Black objects are, are fixed. And you can see that depending on the setup and the tools available, there are a wide range of different kinds of things you could do to achieve your goal from knocking something over, blocking a preventing object in the, in the upper left here, um, catapulting something like here, uh, putting an object stably under this table, uh, using um, objects here, like um, trying to sort of lever or hook something around. There's many different things that, that people can do. And what we, what we find in this game is that people are not, you know, this isn't something you can usually do the first time you try, but within just a small number of um, uh, attempts, people can often figure out how to solve these problems. We like to call this the real trial and error learning, unlike say what people have often talked about in reinforcement learning, um, where there's sort of a loose analogy to how animals or humans might learn from quote trial and error. Real trial and error, and I think real reinforcement learning in humans at least, is more like this. It's not something that takes um, hundreds of thousands or millions of trials, but just a small number, you know, five, 10, um, 15. So how do we do this? Well, we take one of these um, approximate probabilistic simulation models of intuitive physics, and that's, that becomes the um, sort of inner loop of a learning and thinking system that starts off with some kind of basic scene priors of choosing an object and choosing an initial location based on just trying to make something happen, just trying to make contact with movable objects. And then you imagine a few possible um, actions like that, run those through your mental simulator, see what happens. If one of them seems like it's gonna solve the problem, then you try it out in the world. Um, if it doesn't solve, if you can't come up with one, then you basically try, try to choose a different tool and try again. If you try, when you try it out in the world, if it doesn't work, you use what you've learned to update your initial prior, and then you just repeat the whole loop. 
And what we've, we've shown, we've studied human problem solving on a range of these levels. And we've shown that the model does a pretty good job, at least on the basic levels, of capturing the human trial and error learning curves. What you're seeing here in these graphs for 20 levels are the, the cumulative probability that humans in blue or the model in red um, solve a problem after uh, some number of trials, up to 20 trials. Some problems are solved reliably within the first two trials. Others might take five or 10 or more. But the model does a pretty good job of capturing human difficulty and even the actual choices that humans make when they're at the initial stage or the final stages of solving a problem. But it doesn't actually get at the most interesting kinds of learning. And for this, we need to get more symbolic. So if we want to think about what is a tool, it's really like a kind of object-centric abstract strategy for how to achieve something. Like what is a whisk or what is a hammer or what is a catapult, right? A catapult could be many things like these catapults for sending someone into a river um, or this uh, fun pandemic make it at home project um, out of a wooden spoon, a roll of toilet paper, a catapulting a, a, um, a rolled up piece of paper into the trash bin. Um, or in the context of these scenes here, like what makes we us understand abstractly that there's a sort of catapult situation here? Well, we can study in the game. I'm not going to go through the experimental details, but Kelsey and Kevin showed that people can learn these strategies across a couple of examples and then transfer them in near and far ways. And we can capture this strategy learning by basically just replacing that initial prior with a symbolic program that's generated from a probabilistic grammar that talks about objects their, their basic types, properties, and relations that can be used to encode simple versions of, for example, a catapulting strategy. And then, so here, here's an illustration of that, which is something like pick a large tool, choose a um, wide object that's going to be the, the, I don't know even know what it's called, but the thing that's the basic body of the catapult, um, and place the tool um, high enough up on the, on the opposite side in order to achieve the goal. And this can generalize to a number of different scenes, not just the particular one shown here, but all the different ones where people seem to be able to deploy that catapulting strategy. Another kind of learning is like learning the parameters of the, of the physics engine. So seeing just a small number of um, or, or, or short videos of objects um, moving with some unexpected kinds of physical laws or different properties of mass or friction, people can make judgments from just a five second video about the mass or the friction or which objects attract and repel each other. They're not perfect. They, um, with just five seconds, it's not very much information, but they can make reasonable rough judgments. And we can capture these as inferences, Bayesian inferences in a hierarchical symbolic physics model. Um, as a pointer to, this is work, the work I'm showing you here was done by Tomer. Uh, Josh, uh, yeah. Josh uh, you should be wrapping up quite soon. Ah, okay. Um, I will, I will do that. Um, can I take like five minutes? Is that good? Yeah. Or, okay. But um, I'd say, but, uh, but we'd like to have a chance for questions too. Okay. All right. Um, well, I'll just point, point to, again, some latest and greatest that, uh, Tomer Ullman and, but really this is work led by Kai Shu and Akash Srivastava, um, th that have introduced a really nice generalization of this idea in which you're basically doing Bayesian inference in a symbolic grammar for physical laws. That can, that can explain what people do in these cases, as well as in some real world videos. Um, and, that, and that builds in um, the kind of abstract knowledge that physics tells us, like translation invariance, um, or that the dimensions, the type structure of the dimensions have to compute, and shows how to, how to do um, inference of um, the, the laws for just a, a very short videos like we've seen here. Okay. Um, the last thing I was just going to talk about, and I'll just sort of preview this as just something of where we're going, is to say, you know, how could you learn not just the parameters or a single law, but how could you actually learn like a whole physics simulation program? Okay. Um, this is a very hard problem, but in some sense, if you look at the development of intuitive physics, or at least through some combination of evolution, uh, biological, cultural, and children's learning over the first year or two of life, we do do something like this, okay? Um, and I think this is this is really getting at what, um, again, one of the central problems that this community is quite interested in. Um, how do we learn something that looks like a program um, as opposed to just a neural network, right? So the things that make learning a neural network so appealing are smooth end-to-end -end differentiability and, and, the, and or end-to-end -end differentiability and the smooth error landscapes that result.
But if our goal is to produce a program like a simulation program, then we don't have anything like that nice error landscape. Yet somehow we, we are able to solve this problem. <laughs> so this motivates the idea that we've been exploring and that I think a number of people in this community are interested in of the idea of like learning as programming. Um, again, since I, I don't really have much time, I'll just point you to a cognitive science opinion piece that Josh Rule, Steve Piantatozzi and I wrote, in which we sort of explore the general ideas, not just in the context of learning intuitive physics, but this idea of modeling human cognitive development as you know, programming or, or in, the, in the sort of MIT spirit of creative programming as, as hacking, sort of all the ways in which we can think about our intuitive knowledge as code and learning as making your code more awesome. Um, and it's a nice review of how that idea might play out in human cognitive development. On the AI side, we've been exploring this in the context of systems that learn not just single chunks of code like a physical force law, but learn in a sense, an entire domain specific programming language. And here again, I'll just point to, because I don't really have time to go through the details, a system that was the PhD work of Kevin Ellis and with a number of other colleagues. Um, Kevin recently graduated from MIT and he's just started up as an assistant professor at Cornell in computer science. And he built a, a really cool system that's called Dream Coder, which can learn, can, can learn in a number of different domains, including physics, but also other kinds of symbolic or graphics domains um, to solve problems where there's an ensemble of problems that characterize a domain and the system will solve each problem by writing a little chunk of code, but it starts off with a very primitive minimal uh, programming language and over time um, through a kind of a what's, what's, a, what's effectively a kind of a wake sleep learning algorithm learns to grow out its domain specific language to capture the domain expertise um, that a person might build in one of these domains. But it also learns um, in, a, in a different kind of sleep phase um, a, a, through, a, through a kind of the same sort of method that I was saying was used to train those neural networks for pattern recognition in um, bottom-up uh, inverse graphics by drawing, by, by drawing samples of kind of imaginary problems and using those to train a pattern recognition system that can look at the data and um, generate hypotheses that can guide the search for symbolic programs. The system jointly trains its domain specific language or its conceptual vocabulary along with a, a pattern recognition system for guiding the search. And the result is, is does some, again, I think very sort of human-like kinds of things or at least takes a step in that direction. So like in a, in a, in a graphical domain of like building towers or drawing things, maybe this is the easiest way to illustrate it. Um, we might start off with a with a logo like drawing language, a very minimal thing that just says, put your pen down, pick it up, go forward, turn, and then, you know, also like recursive functions, so lambda calculus, out of which we're going to build everything else. And over time, we, we learn to be able to solve, make more complex drawings by building up functions such as these these basic drawing routines, semicircles, spirals, polygons, and higher order functions that take those basic ones and say array them in a radially symmetric way. We're learning basically a kind of deep library of programming routines that capture our expertise and let us express complex things with short programs. And you can see here, um, maybe the, the, the nicest way to visualize what the system is doing is what are the problems it makes up during its dreams that it uses to train the neural search guidance at the beginning of learning, when it only has that minimal logo language, it doesn't really know how to do anything interesting. So its random programs are not are these very simple um, arcs and so on. But after it's learned at this this language of drawing primitives, now when it makes up random problems to solve, you see all this rich but somewhat random structure. So this is just an illustration of how you can make a more sort of developmental bootstrapping approach to building a language of thought, whether it's in this case, a language for drawing, or we can apply the same kinds of things to learning a language for physics. And going forward, and this is where I'll, where I'll leave us, I think this provides the basis for getting beyond that core knowledge state, beyond the intuitive physics and so on that a young child has and focuses on in their first year or two of life, to what are the main accomplishments of cognitive development over the next few years and beyond. It's, it's learning natural language and other kinds of explicitly shareable symbolic codes that ground out on top of the basic intuitive physics, but then let you access all the knowledge that's built culturally across generations. So what, what the, recent, the most recent work that we've been doing when it comes to program learning are various ways of leveraging natural language in the search for programs. Um, such as, for example, where Kathy Wong just presented at the last ICML on ways of basically integrating language into that 
uh, dream coder dsl learning framework okay so that's that's it and this is where i'll where i'll leave us um i've tried to show you what hopefully is a roadmap for building some kind of common sense that might follow the roadmap of of human cognition um and you know not just achieve what i would say ai's oldest dream but really help us understand where our own minds come from um, tools for capturing what might be the starting state in terms of these basic kind of game engine representations of objects and agents and forces and utilities for planning and then this whole neurosymbolic probabilistic modeling inference toolkit that can be embodied in modern probabilistic programming languages and these tools for program induction and synthesis that can help us to both do inference in the original state and show us how we might be able to learn and grow beyond that okay so i'll stop Great. with that and thank you very much for your guys attention